Hey everybody and welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is part four, the last part of our conversation with Bishop Timothy Mansfield. And we're gonna talk about esoteric anatomy and some practices that involve various parts of the body in an esoteric sense. We're gonna talk about the emotions. Where do they live? Are they in the body? Are they in the mind? How do they manifest in the world and in, your, in yourself? That's uh, an interesting conversation that we have. And then we're going to have a brief conversation about reincarnation. Does it, does it happen? What does it really mean when people talk about reincarnation? And uh, it's, uh, the answer might not be exactly what you think. So stick around for the end for that part of it. All of that and more coming up on Talk Gnosis. A lot of spiritual traditions, um, and we mentioned this a bit uh, previously, that um, have very kind of body-centric practices. Um, thinking uh, yoga and other Eastern traditions, including kind of um, what might be called esoteric anatomy kind of things, uh, uh, chakras and kundalini, and um, in a in a kind of Gnostic Voodoo and Poinchot system, um, all these kinds of things uh, that are connected at least loosely to the esoteric traditions um, that have come to. <laughs> <laughs> come to be associated with Gnosticism in some way or another, um, mm -hmm. and we talk about it on the show all the time. Uh, what do well? Let's start with uh, let's start with you, Bishop Tim. Do you do any uh, practices that might fall into this category? And if so, are they uh, what? What is their usefulness to you? Uh, do I do anything currently? Not a great deal. I have in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've found broadly, I've found the various energy anatomy systems useful in the past. Um, I do a lot of, um, I've got a long history of doing a lot of somatic reflection. So um, dealing with emotional stuff, kind of going backwards and forwards between my, my thoughts about the feeling, the physical sensation of the feeling and the tensions or whatever in my body that are associated with the feeling mm -hmm. and moving backwards and forwards between those three levels. So of those that the middle one, the, the feeling itself, um, is the realm of energy anatomy, more or less. So chakras and um, uh, the gates in the aurum solis material or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's points in the middle pillar for the golden, for golden dawn people or whatever. Um, and so it's, esoteric anatomy has really been useful for me. Um, I've used both chakra stuff from time to time um, as a way of kind of trying to, you know, I'm feeling this feeling and it's part of my body. What, what's that close to? What are the traditional attributions to, to sensations in that part of the body? Does that lead me to a different place in terms of understanding what this feeling's about? That's really helpful. Um, and I've used, so there's a traditional, there's a kind of semi-traditional way of mapping the, the tree of life from the Kabbalah, the, the Kirika tree particularly, onto mm -hmm. the human body and sort of connecting um, the sephirot in the, in the tree to different points in the body down the center line and down the, the sides of the body. Mm -hmm. um, and I've used that for, for, similar, for similar things and sometimes done fairly exotic things of like, right okay the emotion showing up in that part of my body well that corresponds to that sephirot that corresponds to this planet that means that's that angel let's call the angel mm. <laughs> <laughs> and have a chat about what this is about you know? what's up with um, that <laughs> <laughs> um i've also just over the years done some i guess qigong and stuff mm -hmm. and that's been helpful um so i think that dimension the kind of energetic sensation of the body as a different dimension of experience from the physical sensation of the body. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's connecting with that and coming alive to that is quite an important part of spiritual work. Um, you can overemphasize it, but I think it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a key or a gateway to reconnecting your awareness and your mind's and your feeling of the feeling of your body. I think a lot of us struggle with those two things being very separate because mm -hmm. of these, pres presumably because we've grown up in the Cartesian worldview for the last few hundred years. Sure. But um, a lot of us find those very far apart, and that energetic sensation of the body is what kind of reconnects things um, and maybe gives us a way forward. That's that's a useful thing for me. I think. 
Sure. When you're talking about energetic sensations, um, as a person who does not experience that in, in any regular way, I mean, are, are you talking about something that might be analogous to a physical sensation, or is it a completely separate set of um, sensory experiences altogether? It's certainly not a completely separate set. They, um, so there's a range of things. Um, you ever felt real anger in the moment? Like not the thought that I'm angry about this thing, I know I must be because my jaw's clenched. <laughs> the actual feeling of, the actual feeling which for most people appears as um, something that begins in the belly and rises as a kind of feeling of heat up through the chest, up to the base of the throat, maybe mm -hmm. higher. Okay, yeah. Um it's not ringing any bells, but I don't pay very much attention to myself. <laughs> it's also an even-tempered New Englander. So. <laughs> uh, you've, you haven't spent much time in Boston, my friend. <laughs> Particularly not driving. Right. <laughs> Although that one time we did drive in Boston, and I almost made you wet your pants, but that was... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. Uh, Anyway, so uh, <laughs> sorry to just to, to Ang anger is probably anger is probably a bad a bad choice of an emotion to talk about. But all, all the emotions that we feel, right? Like we feel them. They're not just, you know, you don't just decide you're scared or mm -hmm. decide that you're sad or decide that you're angry, right? Horny. It shows up as Horny. a as a pattern of thinking, but it also shows up in your body. Mm -hmm. you, you also have physical feelings. As you pay more attention to those physical feelings, you start to notice that. Some of them are clearly muscular tensions or, and some of them are weird things like they've, you know, the feeling of heat moving anger, if you can open more to it is a feeling of heat that moves up through the chest. Um, maybe that's blood flow. Maybe it's something else. Um, but motions are, uh, emotions are always a, a, a physical feeling, usually one that moves. Mm -hmm. So there's a common gag, right? They're called emotions, not E standing stills. Um, <laughs> So, um, so that's the base layer of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about energetic sensations. But then, um, then there's other things where you can have feelings of um, movement or congestion or openness or warmth or cold in different parts of the body for various reasons. Um, you think about a particular scene and you might experience something, some feeling like that, some feeling of something contracted or tight or whatever in the body um and then with practices like yoga or qigong or um esoterics western esoteric stuff like the middle pillar ritual um you visualizing energy moving around your body and that often carries with it a, a semi-physical kind of um related feeling mm. so you, it's not uncommon to feel movements up and down the, the back of the spine or the core of the body in front of the spine um, or to feel things, sensations moving down your hands. Um, you know, so uh, there's, a, there's a kind of vocabulary of it and it goes from very um, feelings which aren't exactly physical but are very closely related to physical sensations to things which don't seem to have anything to do with physical sensations at all that are just... Um, feelings of so the classical things are temperature hot or cold um, movement through the body in one direction or another um, uh, and then tension sort of like something feeling congested or open or moving from congested to open um, and the, it's one of those things that you more, the more you start paying attention to it the more you notice how common it is that it's it's kind of your body's giving you these signals all through the day but we're kind of brought up, you know, <laughs> most of our parents brought us up to ignore them because it's a bit inconvenient when kids pay attention to their emotions, you know? <laughs> they make a fuss about it. They want to talk about it, and that's uncomfortable because you don't want to know about yours. And, anyway. <laughs> do you think... Do you, do you, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tom. No, I think you were going to ask the same thing I was. Go ahead. Okay, well, we'll find out. Uh, <laughs> Excellency, uh, do, you, do you think that this is actually some kind of energy being circulated around the body or is it just a combination of physiological and imaginative actions upon the body right because as we know strong emotions do have um, uh, 
you, you said it before, you know, anger, maybe it's the blood rising up, right? And is it you noticing these things and using a bit of imagination? Or do you personally, just speaking as an individual, believe that there's some kind of energy that is being generated and circulated and moved around? So I've got about three answers to that question. The first one is that it's okay. another question that's above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, second answer is that um, to some extent we okay this is a worldview question so mm -hmm. uh, because we live inside a secular materialist culture it is required of us to give accounts of experiences in terms of stuff that's understood by physical medicine um, yes. otherwise what we're saying must be crazy and we should be locked away in some way. So we're required to say things like, well, you know, it's probably a cascade of neural impulses across the surface of the skin combined with a flush of blood that moves up through the core, that blah, 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 as though that somehow made more sense of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so to some extent, what we're doing, you know, I signaled this way back at the, at the very beginning of the conversation, when we do, are we talking about the mind slash soul, the interior experience, or are we talking about the brain, which is the, the exterior experience? view of, of what's going on for us. Um, and of course, we uh, you know, increasingly understand that there's substantial clusters of nerves in the heart and also in the gut. And so mm -hmm. when we think, it's actually that whole neural system doing some thinking. It's not isolated to the brain. Um, so I, you know, I, I can make some stuff up, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we're in our infancy in terms of how we understand how the neurological system in the human being works. And we're in our infancy in understanding quite how it connects or doesn't connect or interconnects with the other nervous systems of other human beings or of the animals around us or of the natural world. We, we simply don't know. The, the, we've got clues and hints and we've got no idea. So, um, no, can't give a physical account. Uh, do I believe there's – or actually, if I, if I did, um, I'd have to say there's an awful lot of energy moving around. <laughs> I mean, anytime you're talking about the neurological system, you're talking about energy moving around. Anytime you're talking about blood flow in the body, you're talking about energy moving around. Um, so there's that. There is literally energy moving around the body, right? And the way we sense it might not be quite what's happening at the at the, the basic level in the cells, but it's absolutely happening. So, I, that's so I here's the thing. I don't love got, the term. I've got, I've got two more, but go on. Oh, okay. Well, I, <laughs> yeah, go ahead then. I'll I'll come back. I'll remember okay, probably. So my, my, my third one is um, this whole idea of calling anything energy at all, that again, is point. a modern thing. Yeah, I thought that. <laughs> right. okay. I thought going to bring up, yeah. <laughs> it's all the 19th century kind of obsession with using electromagnetism as a way to describe fuck and everything. Right. Pardon me. <laughs> it's yeah. all right. Oh, no, oh, oh we're on public television. Mesmerism, <laughs> the mesmeric energy fluish yes. running Ectoplasm around Ectoplasm and, you yeah. know. All, all this, that. Yeah. All that business. It's all, it's all um, you know, images from a, it's poetic imagery from a particular historical moment. Um, so we don't have to get terribly wrapped up in it. That's my third thing. My fourth thing, I guess, is that, um, oh, sorry, uh, the thing I was saying about interior and exterior, I think it's, um, I think talking about it as energy turns out to be a helpful thing when you're trying to use clear and evocative language about your experience of what's going on. It might not be a great account of what's happening from an exterior physicalist point of view, but that doesn't override its value as poetic language for getting clear about your interior experience. Um, and there's a tendency to want to reduce interior experience into a physicalist account in order, especially when you're talking about spirituality, so that people don't lock you away. But just cut it out. Stop. It's boring. <laughs> I don't propose to stop talking about energy or angels or the divine light or any of that stuff because they're good poetic accounts of interior experience. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what they correlate to in the physical world and I don't particularly care because the game of spirituality is an interior game. It's not about exterior stuff in the physical world. What is it that Lon Milo Duquette says? It's all in your head. You just don't know how big your head is. I don't know how big your head is. Exactly right. So, you know, it's charming that various people try to give similarly crazy poetic accounts of a spiritual experience in terms of quantum physics, but let's not pretend it's got anything to do with quantum physics. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it's just, just as the 19th century people recruited electromagnetism as a poetic language for talking about experience, modern people are trying to recruit, except can't really recruit quantum mechanics. You just sound like, you end up sounding like a moron. There, I said it. 
Um, yep. Well, yeah, fourth... you're in good company here. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you're in. My fourth company. thing, I guess, my fourth thing is that the, I genuinely don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are there undiscovered um, energy style interactions between human beings and things around us? Um, there's certainly enough uh, tall tales from you know, various people in the esoteric and occult communities that are very difficult to give physical accounts of mm-hmm. in terms of our current understanding of physics. Um, so I think it's hubris to decide that we have a canonical answer to that question, and I think we should just stop. <laughs> All right. So I'm glad we've spent 80 minutes now talking about it. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> No, it's true. And, you know, uh, are, uh, are the Archons and Aeons actual uh, independent entities that can be talked to? Or, you know, it's like, uh, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? You, you kind of get into that. Go, after a go have the experience and then we'll talk about it. What do you say? Yeah, sure. <laughs> let's do it. Um, we have a few minutes left. I want to just ask you an easy question. Reincarnation, yes or no? <laughs> What? Why are you laughing? <laughs> um, I've again about my pay grade. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, so look, the 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 people that I've read a little bit of. I mean, I say a little bit to be appropriately modest. I've read more Tibetan Buddhism than most people have, um, <laughs> and really, in terms of people that are. Or you ought to expect to be experts on reincarnation. It's the people who've got a who had a feudal governance system based entirely yeah. on the concept of of valid reincarnation, right? So um, Rinpoche's in Tibet, uh, who ran most of the monasteries, which is where most of the wealth was, were um, a, often, in the case of some of the senior lamas, sixteenth and seventeenth generation reincarnations of the of of a single individual. So you'd hope they had some fair idea of what the hell was going on with reincarnation. And um, I think it's massively misunderstood in the West, largely because of Alexandra David Neal, was it? That that theosophist that went to Tibet and got everything wrong uh, in the 19th century? I don't remember his name, but yeah. Um, yeah, we have this idea of the transmigration of souls, which is right. back to this soul-body split thing that the puppet, uh, the, sorry, the ghost leaves the puppet, the puppet dies. You know, and then the the ghost marches off and then inhabits another puppet, um, a baby puppet this time, a little baby <laughs> puppet, and you know, carries on. Um, no, that that's what the premise is. That's the premise of what is actually happening when, the, for instance, the Dalai Lama reincarnates um, as a new person. But it, but it, except that it's not. Mm. Except that it's actually not. Tibetans don't actually think that's what's going on. Um, so two things. First thing is that doesn't happen for ordinary people. It requires extensive practice, esoteric practice, to hold enough of the mind's stuff together after death such that there's a chance that that can wind up in the body of a new child, right? It's Ordinary people can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> what happens to us is more like what happens to the physical body when you throw it in the compost heap. We kind of just sort of fray apart into bits. Um, it's, it's it's extremely careful practice to get that to happen. And even then, it's a flawed and difficult process, which is why when a senior lama reincarnates, they always have, you know, five or six candidates that have been gathered from the countryside who might be, you know. Um, and I don't think it's clear that anybody thinks that one of them is the real one and the others are all fakes. It's more a question of um, some get more of the stuff and others get less of the stuff and they want the one with more of the stuff because that's going to be a better heir to the previous lama. Sorry, massive digression into Tibetan Buddhism. But um, they don't even think it works the way that, that <laughs> when Westerners talk about reincarnation, um, we think it works. So there's that. The second thing is um, most people, I mean, most people don't remember, I don't think anybody that talks about reincarnation specifically remembers leaving one life and joining another. What they generally have is past life recollections. And based on recollecting fragments of story from from a life earlier in history, they come to the conclusion that they've reincarnated from one body into another body. Um, maybe. Who knows? Um, but there's lots of ways that memories from past lives could have happened. You could be making them up. There, I said it. Um, 
I don't think that's particularly also, controversial. Yeah. That's not particularly controversial. Um, but also, you know, if um, fragments of memories are, you know, if there's, you know, if the kind of stuff we're talking about with esoteric energy fields and whatever has any validity to it, then um, it's quite feasible for fragments of memories to get left behind in the same place that we go to go to look for, for angels, I suppose. Um, maybe you're picking things up. Maybe telepathy works through time and you're seeing someone else's life um, because you're telepathically connected across some toroid of space-time described <laughs> best by um, hyperspace tensor equations that we don't yet understand. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, Anything it's, it's could be happening. It's all quantum physics, I mean, right? It's all quantum physics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is the trouble. Like, we're, we're interpreting these things in terms of classical, you know, generally most people are walking around with a Newtonian model of physics in their heads. Um, and we seize these particular explanations of what's going on because we read it in a book somewhere and we don't think about the other possibilities. Um, and if you open the box and acknowledge that there are other, you know, a large range of other possibilities that we, that aren't accounted for by our mainstream explanation of how the world works, then, um, reincarnation is a very odd, specific, very particular way of, of explaining it. Mm. But I really, I have absolutely no idea. Absolutely no idea. Really. There's, there's, interesting, note, there's interesting stuff in the, in the realm of, of, <laughs> of what people experience as reincarnation. And that's cool and you, we should shut it out. But um, yeah. Yep. Don't know. <laughs> no, that's, uh, <laughs> that's an awful lot of the way we answer a lot of questions in Gnosticism. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, uh, thanks, Bishop Tim. That was a great conversation. Thanks for joining us once again on the show. You're very welcome. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Well, everybody, that'll do it for our four-part series with Bishop Timothy Mansfield on the bodily gnosis. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I know that I did, and I, I learned an awful lot. So uh, please do uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel or our uh, podcast, or both, if you like both. Uh, you can find all the links for that at GnosticWisdom.net. And then uh, remember that we have our Patreon campaign where you can support us every time we produce uh, this Gnostic education content and your support will help us grow the channel and make it more interesting and have better guests and well not that our guests aren't great but anyway that's not the point you can find that on patreon.com slash Gnostic that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Gnostic thanks a lot and we will see you next time around where I think we're going to talk about uh, G.I. Gurdjieff um, although I don't have the schedule in front of me so your guess is as good as mine See what comes next in the playlist, why don't you? All right, have a good night. See you next time.